Let's take a look at the poem called The Raven and look at the actual uh, content of the poem. The poem starts off, Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. A bit of a setting here. We, Poe often uses this Gothic type of setting, so it's often night or dusk, or evening time in his poems. And a sense of weakness or tiredness as we see here in this poem. Very often we have some sort of Gothic setting in the sense of being in an old castle or an old haunted house or something of that sort. And he's, in this poem, our narrator is weak and weary, he says. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. He's been reading and thinking and mulling about here for the evening. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. So this is how the action starts. This is something of a narrative poem. We're going to get a bit of a story in it, and not just a simple setting, but a whole story here as, as Poe goes through the poem. Second stanza. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each dying, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcrease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the, na whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. As you read through the poem, notice Poe's repetitious use of the or type of sound. Lenore, the name of the woman he has lost here, who has died, gone. His love is lost. He often uses that type of sound in this, in this poem. And one of the reasons he did that is that Poe felt that this type of sound, this or type of sound, was very conducive to creating a mood, this melancholy, gothic sort of mood that he likes to create in the poem. Third stanza, and the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. So he gets up from his musings, half asleep, goes to the door to answer this knock that he feels he hears there. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. So he's gone, answered the door, opens it, no one's there. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wandering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. So he hears this same tapping again and goes back to check. No one was there the first time. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. There's a, there are a lot of legends associated with the raven. And we get into some of that here in a sort of inferred way that he wants to talk to the raven as a sort of mythological creature. Indeed, there's the legend that uh, the ravens have to be at the uh, 
Tower of London in London, England, or the British Empire will fall if all the ravens ever depart. And they take it seriously enough uh, that when a raven does leave, they get all excited about it and try to, to do something about it. So there's a great deal of mythology here in Poe's choice of the raven as a bird for this poem. And he begins to talk with it, and of course the raven speaks back to him, much as a parrot might repeat something, and says the word nevermore back to him. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely in the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word did he outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. So he feels like this bird has been someone else's pet. It was taught only one word, perhaps, and that word is never more. So that's what he keeps repeating. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. There upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight's gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, uh, nevermore. Keep in mind throughout this poem, the background here that he has lost the love of his life, this woman named Lenore. We keep coming back to that, and indeed this is the whole motivation behind what happens in the poem. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tickled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. The essence of that stanza is that there will be no comfort for him, no balm in Gilead, nothing to comfort his sorrow, his mourning over the loss of Lenore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. What does he ask? He's asked the bird, will he ever see his lost love again? Will he ever see Lenore again in this, in heaven, in Aden, he calls it here. Raven answers, nevermore. He'll never see her again. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy farm from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, 
on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore.